Good morning, this is Susan Nisley uh, at the Nebraska Library Commission. Today is November 10th, 2016, and we are going to talk today about Overdrive Marketplace. Um, this is a place where you can get uh, statistics about your uh, patrons' usage of the Overdrive system. Uh, you can perform some support functions and you can search the catalog of content available to purchase. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first uh, question to answer today is what is Marketplace? Um, Marketplace is Overdrive's shopping and administrative portal which, as I said, lets you shop for content, see what's available to purchase through OverDrive. It lets you access usage reports, and it also lets you perform several support functions to uh, solve problems your patrons may be having. And one of these support functions incl includes submitting a uh, request, a support form uh, to OverDrive to request assistance if you're not able to provide it yourself. Just as a reminder, um, OverDrive Marketplace used to be called Content Reserve, and I mention that because some of uh, our OverDrive participants have been uh, around since we first started out back in 2008, and I do sometimes have people refer to the admin module as Content Reserve. I think some people still use the old uh, URL that includes Content Reserve in the URL address, um, and I think there is redirection that happens, so it's still working, but I do just want people to be aware that what used to be called content reserve what used to be called content reserve is now called marketplace. Um, this screen shows you the up-to-date URL that you can use to access marketplace. And once you get to this screen, you will be prompted to log in with a username and password associated with either your standard Marketplace account or an Advantage Marketplace account. So just to give you a little bit of background on these two types of accounts. Um, there is at least one standard Marketplace account associated with each member library. Um, usually when a library signs up for OverDrive, I go in and create a Marketplace account using the director's name and email address. Um, and I send that information to the director. Uh, directors can and probably should share this account with other staff members, uh, or they can request additional accounts from me or Devra for their staff members. But that um, Hopefully, after I show you some of the tasks you can perform in Marketplace, you'll see why you do want staff members to be able to have that access. Um, when we get an announcement about a library director change, I will try to track that and go in and create a new account in the new director's name and contact the director and let them know about Marketplace access. So hopefully we keep people up to date in terms of having access to an account. Uh, as far as um, the username format for a standard Marketplace account, the username is usually going to be in a format. If you look at this bottom uh, bullet point on the screen, the username will be in a format that looks like nebraska.lib. And then in place of the three asterisks, it's usually the library director's first initial followed by their last name. So an example would be nebraska.lib.hpotter. That's the standard username format for a standard marketplace account. Uh, standard Marketplace accounts come with uh, the following permissions. Uh, they let you perform support functions, run and view usage reports. You can search the complete catalog of titles available to purchase through OverDrive. 
though you don't have permission to actually submit those uh, titles at, uh, via cards to be purchased. So in other words, you don't have purchase permissions associated with these accounts. Um, and you get access to news and support information. We do have a number of libraries that have Advantage accounts uh, in addition to uh, their regular access to OverDrive. Um, Advantage accounts allow these libraries to purchase additional titles that will just be available for their patrons to use. So if you are one of the 37 libraries that signed up for an Advantage account, you will also have, in addition to your standard Marketplace account, an Advantage Marketplace account. That Advantage Marketplace account does include purchase permissions uh, and any purchases submitted via that account are going to be billed directly to your library and that content will be available exclusively for use by your patrons. So um, how do you know uh, and keep your Advantage account straight from your standard account? Uh, you can always tell um, based on the format of the username that you use to log into the account. Um, an Advantage uh, Marketplace account username will be formatted nebraska.adv. And then instead of asterisks, you will usually have either your town name or your library name. So something like nebraska.adv.hogwarts. I cannot create Advantage accounts for you, but when your library signed up for an Advantage account with OverDrive, OverDrive would have provided that to you. So that would be something that um, you can request uh, changes to directly from OverDrive if you need that. And I can always um, I can always intercede or facilitate that, but it's not something that I can create myself. Um, if you have an Advantage account and you log in using your Advantage login to Marketplace, you will have a slightly different view of uh, some reports that we're going to be looking at. Um, you'll often have an option to limit uh, the report you run to just Advantage titles. So that's something that I don't actually have access to. Um, that's something that you will see when you log into your Advantage account. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at what you see in Marketplace when you log in with a standard Marketplace account. So without further ado, let's go ahead and move to the live Marketplace site and we will start working our way through it. So I've already logged in to Marketplace using a standard Marketplace login. And you'll see up at the top along the blue bar, you'll see you have menu options, which sometimes I refer to as tabs, even though they don't really look like, like tabs. We're going to be talking about uh, the shop option, the insights option, which is now what they call reports, and the support uh, options. And we're actually going to work our way from right to left. So we're gonna start out talking about what sorts of support functions you can perform in OverDrive. So I'm gonna click on the support tab. The first thing I want to point out on this screen is that along the right side of the screen, you do have contact information for two OverDrive uh, team members that are assigned to our consortium as well as to additional consortiums, but they do work with our consortiums. So you'll see Sarah Delano's contact information and Jennifer Renard's contact information. And underneath their picture, you see uh, at least a few bullet points outlining what uh, in particular they can help with. So if you do have questions that you want to direct to uh, OverDrive staff, that gives you some idea of who to call and it gives you contact information. Um, I want to start out talking about the end user support options you have up here in the first section on the page. And the first option I want to look at is manage holes. 
Um, you may have uh, patrons come to you sometimes and they may uh, uh, claim that they have a title on hold but they can't find it anymore. They'll swear they placed a title on hold but when they go into their account and look at their holds they don't see it or they may uh, think that it's taking them too long to get a title that they had on hold and so you may want to go in and get a little bit more information about um, the hold queue for a title. So there are a couple ways you can look up information under Manage Holes. You can do a search by uh, book title, patron barcode, or by the user email address. So just to do a basic uh, lookup first, I'm going to type in the title Between the World and Me. And click Search. And what is displayed now is a list of all of the holds that have been placed on that title. And if you look in the format column right here, you'll notice that uh, we've got listings for both the ebook version of that title and the audiobook version of that title. Uh, you can further see what place a particular person is in the hold queue. So. Um, this person that has email address nmtempleton at gmail.com with barcode 2319, etc., is first in line out of five holes. Then you've got two out of five, three out of five, four out of five. We've got the audiobook listing, and then we've got the person who's five out of five on the hold. And if you look over here um, under user mail, user uh, email address, you'll see I, that's a book that I placed on hold using my uh, work email address as the notification email address. Um, if you click on the little edit uh, pencil icon, uh, it will give you a couple options. One, you can forcibly cancel a hold for a patron if they no longer want to have it on hold. Or you also have the option of moving the person up in the hold list. So um, I'm currently fifth on the hold list. Uh, if I wanted, I could move myself up in the hold list. Obviously, that's not something you want to do on a regular basis. It would be uh, only if there's an extenuating circumstance. For instance, once in a while, a patron will have been waiting for a title for a long time and something will go wrong. They get a notification that it's available for them and then something goes wrong and for whatever reason they lose access to the title and it goes to the next person in the hold list. In cases like that, you can have them place another hold on the title. Um, of course, they'll be at the end of the list, and then you can come into the admin module if you need to and move them back up so they're next in line. You can't get them immediate access to it, but you can at least get them back up at the top of the line if for some reason um, something unexpected happened and they, after waiting a long time, they lost their uh, hold before they had a chance to read it. So that isn't an option. That is an option. That's also something to keep in mind. Sometimes people um, people will claim that they should have had a hold, that a hold should have been available to them earlier than it was. Um, and typically, I know that that's what people feel, but usually it's not the case. Usually, um, they've uh, calculated the hold wait times incorrectly. Or it's always possible that something happened and a particular patron um, got uh, bumped ahead of them just because of something um, untoward happening to their hold. So there are that so that is a possible reason why someone could think they were going to be the next in line for um, a title and maybe they have to wait a turn longer than they thought they could. So that's one of the behind the scenes things that can happen that you can do for a patron um, if the circumstances warrant it. Um, I want to show you a couple other ways you might go about looking up holds. Um, so we already searched by title. You can also search for patron barcode. So if I uh, use the patron barcode that I use when I'm doing demos, uh, I just type in the number. And 
And now you'll see all the holes that I have placed using that particular barcode. So here's Between the World and Me, the book that we were just looking at, that we looked up by title. But you'll also see that I have Night Watch, an ebook on hold, and I'm 10 out of 14 on that hold list. And you'll see I have the Whistler audiobook on hold, and I'm uh, 26 out of 49 on that hold list, or 26 out of 46 on that, that hold list. You can also uh, look up a holds based on a user's email address. Um, you'll remember when you place a hold in OverDrive, uh, you're prompted to enter your user email address so that you can get notification when that hold is available. Um, so I can type in my work email address and again I get to those three titles that I've placed on hold. Um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, sometimes people will think uh, they used one email address uh, to uh, place their hold and maybe they used a different one. So if I type in my personal email address, and I don't actually know if I have any holds, and I don't have any holds on my, my email address at this time there. Um, I'll tell you one of the things that um, happens uh, most often when someone is complaining that they placed a title on hold and they're not um, getting it. Um, you know, if you look up, if you log into their account and you don't see the hold and you search on their barcode and search on their email address and you don't see the hold from the manage holds um, option within Marketplace, uh, hopefully they can tell you the title they're waiting on and you can type that in. So I'm going to type in, I am Brian Wilson. And what happens often is uh, if you look at the user email addresses or the barcodes, what sometimes happens is this happens particularly in cases um, maybe uh, a family has an iPad and um, both adults in the family share the iPad and um, your patron thinks they were logged into their own OverDrive account when they placed a hold, but maybe they were logged into their spouse's account instead. So you come here, look at the user email addresses, and maybe the patron says, oh, that's my spouse's email address. Um, and you look at the barcode, and it's the spouse's barcode. And so they were actually logged into their spouse's account when they placed the hold. So that happens more often than you would think. And here you can see um, it's a different barcode, and it's a different email address um, of mine that this uh, I am Brian Wilson is checked out to. So in that case, that might be a case where you just say, well, then, you know, log into your spouse's account, assuming that's okay with them, and download the book from there. Or once or twice I've had someone actually typo their barcode, and so we could tell that they had checked it out on another patron's account that was just one number different from their own. In that case, we actually forcibly returned the title, had the patron check it out again, and then that's a situation where you might actually go in and bump them back up in the whole list of their next in line again um, to correct for a mistake like that. So that's manage holds. Return titles lets you as the librarian forcibly return a title that a patron has checked out. And there are a couple situations where you might want to do this. Um, I'm going to jump quickly to uh, my Nebraska Overdrive account. And you'll notice I'm on my checkouts page and I've got two titles checked out and I no longer have uh, return buttons. Uh, underneath these titles because I've already either downloaded the uh, book or selected a format. So sometimes what happens is a patron will, not realizing it, they'll either check out a book in a format that they don't have, they can't access that format because of the device they use. Or um, maybe they um, accidentally, after they check out a book, they accidentally select, for instance, a Kindle format uh, of the book but they don't have a Kindle device or a Kindle app, and so they can't really get it. Now that 
the Kindle version of the book has been checked out, the only way that the patron can return it is to log in to go to the Amazon, go to their Amazon account, and they have to check it in uh, via the manage your content and devices page within their Amazon account. Well, what happens if your patron selected Kindle format by accident? Um, maybe they don't even have an Amazon account. And if they do have an Amazon account, you know, maybe they're not used to, maybe they never access Kindle format books through their Amazon account. Do you really want to walk them through the process of creating an Amazon account or logging into their Amazon account and going to the manager content and devices pages and walking them through the process of returning it there? Or do you just want to log into the admin module and return it for them? And so I'm going to go ahead and go back then to the admin module and we'll go ahead and try to return that um, tricky 22 title. So tricky 22, I'll look it up by title. Now that there are actually, we actually own multiple copies of that title. So I'm going to have to look through and see if I can find the correct, uh, the correct copy, and you'll come down here and you'll see number 16 on the list, Susan Nisley at Nebraska.gov, and you'll see the um, barcode that I've been using, the account that I'm assigned into is associated with that barcode. So I can go ahead and select um, that checkout, and then come up and click on return. It will ask me to confirm. I'll say okay. If I go back to my account and refresh, you'll see that that title's returned. Now they'll tell you in the uh, marketplace that sometimes uh, when you perform an action on a patron's account, it can take up to 30 minutes to take effect. Usually it's instantaneous, like in this case, you may just have to refresh the screen or go away from the screen and come back to it. But you'll see now that we've returned that title for the patron without having to log into their Amazon account. So that's handy to be aware of. Uh, another option on the support screen that you probably won't have to use very often, but that it's important to be aware of is merge user IDs. This is an option you would use if a patron has a library barcode they've been using to log into OverDrive for some time. Maybe they lose that card and so you cancel that account or that card number within your ILS and you issue them a new card with a new barcode. Well, now that you've canceled their original uh, library card number, um, they're no longer going to be able to log into OverDrive using that barcode, but they may have books checked out on that barcode. They may have holes that they've placed that they're waiting for on that barcode. They may have a wish list that they constructed on that barcode, and they're going to lose access to all of that information. It's not going to show up under their new barcode unless you merge the old barcode with a new barcode. So um, I'm not going to go ahead and do this, but I can walk partway through the process. So say I... Um, I lost my barcode that ends 47111111. My library, so I type that in as my original barcode. I search and I can see um, I have one checkout and three holes associated with that. The library's issued me a new card number 251402471222. Um, and you'll see I've already placed a hold on using that card, but if I check both of those, the old barcode and the new, then my merge button becomes active and I could click on merge and all of the activity on my old uh, 4711111 barcode would now appear under my 4712222 barcode. So that is something to be aware of if you are um, canceling one barcode for a patron and issuing them a new one. Finally, there's a reset downloads option that um, 
can take care of download problems that your patrons occasionally have. Um, this happens most often with audiobooks. Um, for both audiobooks and ebooks, there's a limit to how many times during a checkout period a patron can click on that download button. Um, because obviously Overdrive and the publishers don't want a patron sharing their account login information and letting everyone in their book club access their account and download um, a particular title. So for audiobooks, that download limit is three times. So after a patron has clicked on the download button three times, they're no longer able to download that title anymore. It's locked. Um, this sometimes is a problem if there are problems with the download, if your internet access is spotty and the download gets cut off. So it's not completely unusual for um, technical difficulties to cause a patron to click three times and then um, be locked out of being able to download. So again, I'm going to go ahead and show you what that error message looks like. It's pretty distinctive if you know what's going on. So um, I'm going to try to download the audio book version of the help mp3 so I click on download and I get an error message that says an error occurred I get an error code and it says failed call to fulfill the title the fulfillment limit of three for the requested title has been reached so anytime you see that message um, the fulfillment limit has been reached um, that's a situation where you may be able to go in and reset the download for the patron. So I'm going to go ahead, go in to reset download. Again, um, I can search for that problem, uh, check out by barcode title, check out ID. So I'm going to type in uh, my barcode. Okay, and you'll see um, it still hasn't caught up that with the fact that I've returned Tricky22, but it shows that I've got the help audiobook checked out. And the way you can see if this is a title that can be reset is you go over to the right, click on View. And you'll see right here under Download, it's remaining, it says zero. And you also have a reset users download link button. If um, they haven't used up all their downloads, you won't see this link. It does ask for the reason for resetting or reactivating the title. And you can type something in there if you want, but I found that that's not necessary. So I'm going to click on reset users download link. Um, I get confirmation that the link's been reset. You can see now there are three downloads remaining again. And if I go back to my account and I try to download again, you'll see the download process starts like you would expect it to. And I'm obviously not going to finish it now, but you'll see I'm no longer getting that error message. Okay, so... We've talked about the support options at the top of the screen. In the middle of the screen, you do have links that take you to some help resources. The first link is to the Marketplace User's Guide, which is a 119-page PDF document, uh, basically a user's manual for Marketplace, so that's available to you if you want it. Uh, there's also a link for Overdrive Help, and this actually takes you to the same help website that you get to if you click on the help uh, link within the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries interface. Overdrive Resource Center takes you to uh, pages on Overdrive's website where you can access different marketing materials, you can access uh, recordings of training sessions, you can get collection development help, and FAQs. 
You can also click on a link to uh, take you to a schedule of live webcasts that you can register for if you want to attend online training. So they have both online training that you can attend and they usually have recordings of their online sessions as well. So those are help resources available to you. And last but definitely not least, this is very important, um, you have the contact uh, button for technical support. So this is an option that's available not to your patrons, but it is available to you from within Marketplace. So again, you can see why it's so important for you and your staff to have um, access to Marketplace. When you click on this link, you will get a form that you can fill out to report a problem that a patron is having that you are not able to solve. So um, the name and email associated with the Marketplace account you've logged in with will be auto-filled. You then have a drop-down menu and you can try to select the category that best describes the problem your patron is having. Based on the issue category you choose, for example, a common one, people have problems downloading. Um, the uh, required fields on the remainder of the form may vary. So what information you absolutely have to type into the, fee into the um, form before you submit it um, will vary depending on the issue category. So usually they do want the patron's username and their email address, although that's not always a required field. Usually they want the patron's barcode. They want a description of the problem. Oftentimes, they need to know the format of the title that the patron's having problems with, and they need more specifics than just ebook. If possible, they want to know if you're having problems with the Kindle version or the EPUB version, etc. Any error message text, and then information about the um, hardware that you're using, so the operating system on a computer, browser, um, if you're using a particular app, what kind of device you're using. So as much information as you can gather from the patron and then you can submit that um, problem report to tech support. They um, indicate that they will usually get back to you within 24 hours. Usually it's more like a couple hours, but they will get back to you via email. And so um, they will either send you um, some steps to try to solve the problem, or they may ask you for more information and you may have to go back and forth with them. But this is the primary way to contact support. Um, if one of you contacts me with a question about a problem a patron is having and I'm not able to answer it or figure out what's going on, this is what I do. I go in and I submit one of these um, support cases via the marketplace. So that is something that is available to you. And sometimes if timing is of an essence, you might not wait if I'm out of the office um, early one afternoon. You might not want to wait until the next day to have me um, submit that to Overdrive. So that is something you can do yourself. Um, so questions about uh, the options that are available to you on the support page. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in the question box and I will try to uh, keep track of that as we go along. Um, just as a reminder at this point, um, I noticed that a number of individuals have uh, logged in since I started and so I, um, I will be able to look after the fact and take down your names and record you on my attendance sheet. But if you have additional staff members attending with you, please uh, remember to type their names in the question box and submit those to me so that I can add them um, as attendees in the class for CE credit. Um, if you're the one that logged in to the session, um, your name and email information is captured, but anybody else attending with you, I won't know unless you um, type that information into the question box and send it to me. Okay, so now I want to move on and talk about reports. Um, in the past, uh, there used to be a nice uh, word on this uh, menu that said reports, which was nice and straightforward, but for whatever reason they decided to change the wording to insights. So that has caused some confusion for people. And you have a drop down, a uh, little drop down menu here, and you have two choices under insights. You have dashboard and reports. 
I'll show you what dashboard is, but it is usually not what um, you're going to want to go into. Um, it gives you basically an at the it gives you at the at a glance insight into the digital collections current activity, as well as trends over the last 12 to 24 months, respectively. Um, the information is uh, for the consortium as a whole, and it includes um, Advantage owned titles that Advantage libraries have purchased. So it's um, it's all activity of consortium members. Um, you'll see right here, front and center, under current activity, you can see how many holds are currently um, active. So there are currently 8,484 holds. And you can see the breakdown by ebook and audiobook. And if you hover your mouse over the two parts of the pie chart, you'll see that ebooks, um, there are 5,673 uh, holds on ebooks. That's 66.9% of the holds. And if you hover over the green audiobook portion of the pie, you'll see 2,811 holds on audiobooks, 33%. You have a similar uh, display for checkouts, current checkouts by format. So there are currently 13,653 titles checked out um, by consortium members. Uh, the majority of those are ebooks. 64% of those checkouts are ebooks. 35.9% are audiobooks. You also have a pie chart that breaks uh, current checkouts down by audience. So you can see uh, adult uh, checkouts um, are, make up 80% of total checkouts. Uh, young adult uh, titles make up 11% of the checkouts and the juvenile titles make up 8%. Down in the trends section, you get trends by format, and you can display them for the last 24 months. And you'll have uh, checkouts by format by month. So for November 2014, you can see uh, ebooks, how many ebooks were checked out, how many audiobooks, and you can move your way month by month or you can change the display to the last 12 months. And you may notice there's this little blip of orange, uh, which the, the um, key tells you is videos. Our consortium's chosen not to purchase videos at this point, and a couple videos accidentally got ordered and OverDrive wasn't supposed to let those through and they accidentally did. So for, for a brief period in time, we had a couple of videos that got checked out. And so um, even though we uh, turned those back in, that information is still showing up in historical statistics. Uh, you could also see unique users consortium wide over the previous 12 months, the last 12 months. And you can see a chart that tracks checkouts and holds um, in uh, conjunction with purchases. So, you know, do, do checkouts and holes go up uh, when we submit uh, more per more titles, when we purchase more titles? So you can track that as well. So as you can see, that's useful information. It might be information you'd share with board members if you just wanted to give them some background, but it's not necessarily the kind of information you're going to want to track um, monthly on behalf of your specific library. For that, you will want to go into the reports section. The first report that I want to look at is probably the report that most libraries are going, going to want to run most often, and that is circulation activity. Um, and I want to point out, when you click on a report category, circulation activity, you get to a screen that dis displays a report that was just run. And this often throws people for a loop. Um, because they'll look at their report and maybe it's not really showing them what they are looking for or what they remember um, running in the past. The thing to keep in mind is that when you access a particular report, um, the last report criteria you selected for that report type 
um, is remembered and a report is run. So you're basically seeing the last report that was run under this um, category. So what I tell people and remind people is you almost always, once you access a report category, is you want to go ahead and run new report. So here we're seeing checkouts by branch. Um, so for Shadron Public Library um, from uh, October 2015 to September 2016. So that is the criteria that was last used for a circulation activity report. So what I want to do is I want to come in here, click run new report, and now I have all my report options that I can go through and select again. So we're going to actually look at four different circulation activity report um, permutations that you can run. So um, sometimes uh, we want to look at consortium level circulation by month for the past participation year. So to do that, I'm going to go to Checkout Spy as my first uh, category. And this is actually the information that's going to be displayed up and down the left side of your chart. So Checkout Spy, I want month. And I'll just mention here that the two criteria I choose here is almost always either month or branch. Usually I'm not looking for statistics by day of the week or by publisher or subject or title. I usually want to see branch level checkouts or checkouts by month. So we're going to say checkouts by month. In this particular case, we are interested in consortium wide consortium level statistics. So I don't want Shadron in there anymore. So I'm going to click on the little X there and I go back to my default all branches. I'm not wanting to limit by format, language, audience, rating, subject, anything like that. Um, under period type, I have two options. I can select period type last. Um, then I've got a number I can enter, and I can select either days, months, or years. Or I can specify a particular period of time. And so in this case, I've selected October 1st, 2015 to September 30th, 2016, which is a typical fiscal year. And then I click Update. And this is my chart. And like I said, checkouts by month was what I selected. And so the month is what it, the months are what's listed on the left side of the screen. And I can select Sort Ascending. And you'll see you have a number for each month of how many titles circulated. And then up at the top of the column heading under checkouts, you've got the annual total. So how many titles were checked out consortium-wide during this particular fiscal year? If you want to actually dig down a little deeper, you can click on the month. And at this point, you're going to get uh, a listing of all of the titles checked out in that month. And you'll see that um, for 50 titles are displayed per page. You've got 42,817 total titles. And um, that takes up 857 pages. So it's a big report. I will use this uh, particular report, however, to show you a little bit of how to um, go through and work with these reports. Um, you can, uh, you'll notice there are lots of column headings and they're hard to see. So you can always um, hover your mouse in between two columns and then when your cursor changes into that little um, line, you can uh, widen or narrow those different um, columns. You can also go through and if you click on the, you've got the option to sort by the criteria in any of these columns. So I, I can open that up and I have a columns option and I can actually um, uncheck columns that don't contain information that I'm particularly interested in. So I'm going to go through and uncheck edition, creator, language, um, subject, publisher. Um, this also lets you see the full heading spelled out. Um, 
So that's also sometimes useful. I'm going to unselect checkout ID, um, renewal, because we don't use that in our consortium. So, you know, I can make my chart a little bit more manageable to read. So just to walk you across one of these rows, um, the first title alphabetically is And Baby Makes Two. It's an adult fiction title, ebook format, um, date added to the site. So this um, copy was added in December 2013. Uh, we own one copy. Um, you'll see a license is purchased and licenses left, licenses used. Um, in this case, this book is available on a one copy, one user ownership model, and so we own one copy. If this had been a book that was available for 26 checkouts instead of one copy listed under ownership, um, it would say licenses purchased, um, perhaps 26. Um, and then licenses used, maybe 10, licenses left, uh, you know, 16. Uh, we can see that this title is checked out by someone at Gothenburg. Uh, when they checked it out, it was checked out for 21 days. Um, and here's their barcode. So that's the kind of information that you can glean from this report. And I think, let me just look at my column headings. Okay, so anyway, that is how you can drill down um, on a, a report. So I'm going to go ahead and go back, and I want to run a different circulation activity report. This time, um, I want to uh, compare annual circulation by branch. So maybe you want to see how your annual circulation compares to other libraries in the consortium. So to do that, I can change checkouts by month to checkouts to branch. And I will leave um, the branch option set to all branches. And I want to see the information for the same time period, so October 2015 to September 2016, an update. And because we have 170 libraries in our consortium, I'm going to go ahead and ask to see uh, 500 um, rows displayed on one screen. And now you can see I've got 170 branches listed in descending order based on number of checkouts. So you can see Kearney Public Library patrons checked out 46,000 titles, and um, then you can scroll your way down and find your library and see how many you checked out. So this is really useful to see how your circulation compares to other libraries that are of similar size to your library. Maybe you want to see your own library's monthly circulation broken down by format, ebook versus audiobook. So that's a possibility. Um, in this case, you would go back and say checkouts by branch and change that to checkouts by month. You're not interested in all branches. You're interested in your specific branch. So you'd open up this branch dropdown and you choose, in this case, I'm going to choose Shadron Public Library. And um, under format then, you'll see I have the option of specifying a particular ebook format, or I can just say all ebooks or all audiobooks. So I'm going to say all ebooks. And then I have a monthly, the monthly uh, numbers for how many ebooks checked out each month. I can go back and I can then do the same thing for audiobooks. And if I record those numbers, I may just want to then go ahead and do the same report uh, and run it for all formats just to make sure that when I add ebook and audiobook monthly checkouts together that they equal the all formats option. So that's um, an option on this uh, circulation activity report. 
The one other um, option you may want to run is you may want to compare uh, your monthly circulation by audience, adult versus juvenile or YA, and you can do that from this uh, uh, report options form as well. So I'm going to continue looking at checkouts by month for Shadron Public Library, but now under audience, instead of uh, retrieving results for all audiences, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say I want adult fiction and adult nonfiction. So I'm going to select adult fiction and adult nonfiction to get my adult circulation numbers by month for Shadron. So again, you've got the monthly breakdown, the annual breakdown up in the column heading. So now if I want to see the number for Juve YA, I can come back and I have four options here. I've got juvenile fiction, juvenile nonfiction, young adult fiction, and young adult nonfiction, and run that report. And now I've got the Juve YA numbers. So that's how you can run a report broken down by audience. So that's the circula circulation activity report, which I think is what you'll run most often. Um, I also want to just point out current waiting list. Um, this is something that we use at the consortium level because it can give us a snapshot of titles that users currently have on hold, and this helps us make decisions about um, which titles we want to we may want to purchase additional copies of. So. Um, just to follow my own advice, instead of looking at the report that was automatically generated, I'm going to come down here and click Run New Report. And I can see that the last time I ran a report, I was looking at um, hold information for Shadden Public Library. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And you'll see I again have a choice of all branches. The other option um, is standard or mobile website, which usually Usually we're not interested in that level of detail. We don't really care whether the um, user was connecting to Nebraska Overdrive Libraries via a mobile device or via a device that used the standard website. That's usually not something we track. So report options, I'm going to search all branches, uh, current waiting lists. Information I get. Number of users on the waiting list broken down by format. So there are 2,805 holds on audiobooks, 5,664 on ebooks. The average wait time for a title on hold is 28.6 days. Again, this title, this uh, report is uh, sorted alphabetically by title, and you've again got on um, the multiple common head the multiple column headings. So going through um, the first title, Three Truths and a Lie, information that you might be interested in. Um, this tells you that on this title, the consortium owns three copies of this title. Um, Advantage libraries don't own any copies of this title. Um, if this title was licensed instead of owned, we'd have information about the licenses left here. Um, the next two columns show all holds. So there's one uh, hold on this title. And then it asks, then you've got a column that says advantage holds. So how many um, of those holds have been placed by patrons of advantage libraries and one? So basically that's identical. Um, you've got the consortium hold ratio, which gives you a number that is indicative of the number of holds per copy. Um, and you've got a column that says, indicates whether or not this title is still available to purchase, the price, and you've got a branch column right over here. Um, you notice that a couple of these uh, numbers are hyperlinks. So under all holds, you can click on that. And what it will show you is it will show you the date the hold was placed, the email address of the person who placed the hold, and their barcode. So that information um, may be useful. If you come over to the branch column and click on the number under the branch column, it'll tell you which library 
um, those holes are associated with. So the patron that has a hole in this title is a patron of York Public Library. Um, because York is an advantage library, it does indicate um, that there's one hold and that one hold is also um, placed by an advantage library. Um, how I would normally want to uh, sort this report would be I'd, I want to see the titles that have the most holes per copy. So I would come here to the consortium ratio column and I would sort descending. So I'm going to see which title um, has the most holes per copy. In that case, in this case, it's truly madly guilty. Information that would be useful in this case, this is an example of a title that is licensed um, for a certain number of checkouts as opposed to owned outright. So it's going to tell you, and this is a little bit co confusing, you have to look at the column heading. There's going to be two numbers separated by a slash. The number before the slash is the consortium number. The number after the slash is the advantage library number. So the licenses left column says that the consortium still has 181 licenses left and advantage libraries have um, licensed this title as well and there are 239 licenses shared among the advantage libraries. Licenses used, you've got all holes, 88 of those 88 holes, 56 of those are placed by patrons of Advantage libraries. Again, if you click on um, one of those hold numbers, you'll see a list of uh, all the holes, the dates they were placed, email addresses and barcodes. If you back up, whoops, and now it changed my sort back to the default, which is always annoying. So I'm going to resort by consortium ratio, hold ratio. Now if I come back to branches, it tells me that those 88 holes are placed by patrons of 44 libraries. And then this is sometimes useful to see actually an alphabetical list of the libraries, um, how many holes um, patrons of their library are uh, associated with. And then there's also a column and you can see whether that particular library is an advantage library. One of the reasons this is nice is if you're an advantage library, then um, you may want to consider if you've got five patrons waiting for a particular title, you may want to consider purchasing a copy because that way your patrons will get it right away. So one other interesting piece of information um, you may want to get access to at this point is um, you can go to a detailed record for this particular title if you click on the title link. And I'm going to actually right click and open it in a new tab just because if I that keeps it from resorting my um, report back to the default. The information that you can glean from this screen is you can actually look at the um, licensing model, whether it's purchased on a one copy, one user basis, or in this case, um, it's earlier at 52 checkouts or 24 months. Um, down here, and we're going to talk, when, when we talk about searching the catalog of titles available to purchase, we're going to talk a little bit more about this kind of display, but you'll see here, um, the first line gives you consortium holdings information. The second uh, line gives you advantage library holdings information. You'll see the consortium owns basically four copies of this metered access title. And if you click on that four, you'll see when, when these four titles were purchased and when they expire. Similarly, you'll see that advantage libraries own five copies. And if I click on this own um, metered access five link. I can actually see which um, advantage libraries have purchased copies and also when their, their uh, copies expire in this particular case. So that is the waiting list. Um, we are, it's, it's 11 o'clock already, um, which um, isn't surprising because it's hard to get all this information covered in an hour. Um, 
So I'm going to try to um, speed this along. Um, and instead of looking at some of these other reports, which aren't as likely to be used, um, I want to jump down to user statistics. And I want to show you one more um, report here before we move on to searching for available titles. Um, you've got search checkouts. This report is actually identical to the um, option under the support tab that lets you uh, that uh, lets you um, shoot. It is basically identical to, I think, the um, return titles option under the support uh, category. New user registration just lets you see um, new barcodes that have logged in, but those barcodes haven't necessarily checked out titles. What, uh, what libraries sometimes want to know is how many patrons do I have using my OverDrive service? And that's what you can find out with this unique user activity um, option here. So I'm going to click on that option. And again, I'm going to go ahead and go down to run new report. And I'll show you about three permutations for this report. So um, I want to, in this case, I want to see unique users with checkouts by branch. And I'm specifically interested in my specific library. So I'm going to say Shadron. Shadron Public Library is selected. And this, in this case, I could do last one year, or I could do specific and do uh, 1001, 2015 to 930, 2016, which is the typical uh, fiscal year, and do update. So in this particular case, it is telling me that in the last year, in the last fiscal year, Shadron Public Library had 144 unique users use their OverDrive service. So that is sometimes a useful um, uh, number to have on hand and be able to report to boards. So questions about... Um, I think we'll just go on at this point just because of time considerations. Um, hopefully those reports that I've showed you are the ones that you're most likely going to want to use. And hopefully you have a little bit more um, idea how to manipulate those reports. Um, do you guys have any questions? Uh, if so, please type them in. Otherwise, we're going to switch over and talk about searching content available to purchase. Um, usually the first thing you see when you log into Marketplace um, is the Marketplace shop. You can also return to the Marketplace shop at any time by clicking on the OverDrive Marketplace logo up in the upper left corner of the screen. That takes you back to the basically the Marketplace homepage. Um, if you're logged in with a standard account, Marketplace account like I am, you're not going to be able to actually submit titles for purchase. But it is still, I think, really important to be able to know how to search through the catalog to identify titles that could be purchased. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, sometimes a patron asks about a title that's not in the Nebraska Overdrive Library's collection and it's helpful sometimes to be able to go in, search the OverDrive Marketplace catalog and tell them, well, actually, that title's not available to purchase through OverDrive for whatever reason the publisher didn't um, make it available to OverDrive to um, offer. Um, sometimes you can also search to see whether a title is available in the format a patron is interested in. For instance, a week or so ago, um, a librarian called on behalf of a patron. We have um, a couple of the Hank the Cowdog books in ebook format in our collection, and the patron was interested in audiobook. So we 
we went in and we searched Overdrive Marketplace, and what we found is that none of the the Hank the Cowdog books are available in the audiobook format through Overdrive. So knowing that, then the the librarian just moved forward to the next option, which was trying to identify um, audio versions to interlibrary loan. So again, that's the kind of information you can call me for, but Sometimes it's nice just to be able to do that search yourself, and so I want you to be aware that it is an option available to you. Um, the other scenario might be that a patron's interested in a title that's not in our collection. Sometimes it's nice to be able to go in, search the marketplace, and tell them, yes, that is available. We just don't happen to own it, but I'm glad to submit that um, as a title, as a purchase request to our selectors. And so you can do that. You can offer that to patrons. And sometimes also, um, you can actually see uh, forthcoming titles in here. So maybe, you know, a patron has found out that we have um, the ebook version of Bruce Springsteen's autobiography that was just released in October, but they want the audio version and they're asking, well, why the ebook's available? Why isn't the audio? If you go in and search, you'll see the audiobook version doesn't come out until early October, early December, I'm sorry. So you can just tell them, well, it's just not available yet, but you know, we'll let selectors know there's interest and then um, we can try to get it when it is available. So all that kind of information often helps with um, patron interactions. Um, when you search, um, there are actually a couple of different catalogs you can search, and that's not immediately obvious. By default, any searches you perform are done across the one copy and one user and metered access content, which is typically what you want to search. So usually that's not a problem, but I just want to point out um, you do have a couple other cat categories. There's a cost per CERC, which our consortium doesn't uh, participate in. There's a simultaneous use option that we don't participate in. Finally, there's the self-published category. And so there may be situations where someone is looking for a title that you know is self-published or came out through Smashwords or something like that. You might not find it when you search the standard one copy, one user and metered access catalog. But if you go to the self-published cate category, you might find it. So just to be aware of that. Um, the search that I use most often is just this search box up at the top of the screen, and this is usually if I have enough information that I can pretty clearly identify the title I'm looking for. So often I will type in a user um, an author name and a title in this screen. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Janet Ivanovich. Tricky 22 and do that search. It's a nice, easy search because I only get two results, and so that's going to let me talk about um, the information that you get for each result and how to interpret the screen. You'll see um, my result list is sorted by relevance. Other sort options that might be of interest include things like um, hold ratio holds, popularity at my site, popularity across libraries, um, etc. So you have some options for sorting. Um, you can tell at a glance that there's an audiobook version. You can tell that because you've got little um, headphones icons associated with the first record, and you'll see that if you purchase the audiobook version, uh, it's going to be available in both the MP3 format and the Overdrive Listen format. It costs $47, and it's available. Um, the licensing model is the one copy, one user ownership model. So you buy it at that price, and you um, own it um, for ostensibly forever. The second uh, record is the ebook version. You can see the little ebook icon and it comes in three formats, the Kindle format, Overdrive Read, and Adobe EPUB. It's $26.97 and it's also available on that one copy, one user ownership model. One thing I'll point out for the audiobook, and this is something we try to always um, be aware of, um, 
audiobooks are either abridged or unabridged, and we try to only buy the unabridged version. Um, and so we do try to always look at that for audiobooks. Once in a while, a patron will complain about, well, why don't you have the audiobook for this particular title? If you come in and you search it in the marketplace and you pull up a record for the audiobook and we don't own it, you might be wondering why. Sometimes if you notice, um, it's a bridge that would be something you could tell your patron, well, it's available, but only in a bridged format. So that's probably why we didn't purchase. I know every time a patron has requested an audiobook and I go back to them and say, well, it's available, but only in a bridged format, do you still want it? They always say no. So um, we do try to avoid those abridged formats. Um, there's ownership information that's included in the record. And so I want to go ahead and try to interpret that for you again. Um, in this particular case, the audiobook, the consortium owns seven copies. Six of those copies are checked out. It's been checked out a total of 351 times since we purchased it. Advantage Libraries own three copies. One of those copies is currently out. And then they have a total checkouts by Advantage users. So 214 of the 351 checkouts uh, were by patrons of Advantage libraries. And you've got similar information down here then for the ebook. So that's a real basic search. Um, if you're going to just do an author search, sometimes you get more complicated results. And so I'm going to do a search for Stephen King as an author. And as I begin typing, um, you will see that um, I have a drop down with some suggestions. And Stephen King is one of the suggestions under author, and so I'm going to go ahead and just select that. And you'll see in this case I get 359 results, so a little bit more complicated. Um, and as you start to scroll through, you're going to notice some things. The first title is pre-order, so it's not currently available. It won't be available until um, May of 2017. And then you'll start noticing we've got titles in German, which obviously we're not interested in. And I will point out, sometimes this is more, sometimes foreign language versions of titles are more obvious than others. If you've got a title that's a single word and the word is the same in English as it is in a foreign language, sometimes it can be really hard to notice that um, you've got a foreign language edition. Um, I think we wound up with a Swedish language version of um, one of the divergent titles because it looked identical and we didn't catch the little uh, the little uh, Swedish uh, label under languages. So if you're finding a lot of foreign language titles, one thing you can go do is you can go down and you've got a lot of filter options along the left side. Uh, you can go down and you can limit your search to just English. So in this case, it drops it to 178 titles, which is a little bit more doable. Um, now you'll also notice there are um, format filter options, but you can't be generic. You can't say just limit to ebook or just limit to audiobook. You have to limit by specific um, ebook format, like Adobe EPUB or Overdrive Read or Kindle. So you can do this if you want to. That's an option. Um, but um, this is once you start having to do a lot of filters. Um, that's a situation where sometimes it's better if you can do some of this filtering ahead of time as you construct your search. And so I do want to go and show you, I want to go back to the main uh, marketplace search page. And that's when you might want to use either the basic search option or the advanced search option. So you've got the quick search box at the top. You also have a basic search option over on the left. And if you click that, you'll actually see quite a few options you can um, set before you even perform your search. So I might want to go in and type Stephen King in the author field here. I can limit my search ahead of time to format. So 
I could go down here and you'll see that I can li limit by specific audiobook format or I can just say audiobook. So that's what I want to do. Um, and then down here, there's some interesting options. Um, and one of those options is holdings. And you'll notice if I check the box, then a drop down menu appears and I have several holdings options. And one of those holdings options is not in collection. So that seems like a really great option because you might be thinking, okay, well, let's see what Stephen King titles we don't own that maybe we want to purchase. So I'm going to go ahead and select not in collection. And I'm not saying this is a bad search in any way, but I want to show you one of the dangerous things about this type of search. Um, and one interesting thing is one of the, um, you don't have the option of, of um, specifying language beforehand. So in this case, I still have to come over here and limit my search to English. So now you've got Stephen King audiobooks that are not owned by the consortium. So you might be scrolling through and you might, all of a sudden you see Christine, we don't own the audiobook version of Christine, you know, what a travesty, we should own that. Um, so here, Christine Unabridged Audio. Um, actually, we do own it, so I want to go ahead and show you. Um, what we don't own is we don't own this particular edition. So let me go ahead and jump back to our Nebraska Overdrive Library's account. And I'm going to type in Stephen King, Christine. And you'll see we do own the audio version of that. This just happens to be a different edition. And this particular edition is no longer available to purchase through OverDrive, which is why it doesn't and wouldn't show up in our search. Um, so, um, you know, they, they've not, they're now offering a new edition. We don't own that. And so they don't flag it with ownership information. So that's just something to kind of be aware of. It's really easy sometimes to think we don't own a title when we really do. So it's always good to double check on that. A um, couple other search options I just want to show you that are a little bit different. Um, under that basic search, it is interesting because you can search, um, you know, now that we have licensed content that expires after a certain number of checkouts or after a certain time period, um, one of the things you can do is you can actually say, okay, show me titles that are in the collection but have zero checkouts left, or um, show me uh, titles that are in the collection that have zero days remaining. And that's a way that you can sometimes go in and, um, or it's a way that we go in at the consortium level sometimes and just look and see um, what titles have expired. Um, and then we might look at whether we want to reorder um, them or whether we want to weed them out of the collection. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, to be aware of is if an Advantage library owns a copy of a title that's that was owned at one point by the consortium, we can't weed that title. So it's going to still show up in the consortium as being um, something that um, patrons can see it, but there aren't going to be any titles available for them to check out. So um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's just do a search for Ready, Set, Jet in the Nebraska collection. And I can show you what it looks like if um, your patron stumbles on a title that um, it's still showing up, but we've used up all of our allotted time or checkouts. So it'll say available copies zero, library copy zero. So we don't have access to this anymore. It's still in the collection. Patrons can place holds on it, but that's going to frustrate them if we don't go in and then purchase an additional copy. So we'll either try to weed these titles if we can. The exception is if an Advantage library happened to own this, then we couldn't weed it from the consortium collection. So again, just to kind of clue, clue you in, so if you see something odd like this, you might have 
half a chance of like stumbling to what's going on. Um, I do want to point out that you do have an advantage. Um, I'm sorry, an advanced search option as well. And that takes you, when you click on advanced search, it does take you to a completely different screen. Um, you can specify a uh, format. Uh, up here, you can do ebook in general or a specific ebook format, audiobook. Um, and then you have the different fields that you can fill out. Um, probably the uh, unique options under the advanced search screen would be that um, you can actually limit your search by uh, to only titles that have you know X number of holds or more. So if you want to see what titles um, we might want to get additional copies of, that might be one way to do it. Um, you can also uh, use some of these interest and reading level um, options if you want to search for titles um, that fit into a certain parameter in terms of reading or interest level. So those are some of the unique features on the advanced search screen. Um, usually I'm able to do all my search using either the quick search up at the top or the um, basic search option that opens up some uh, different um, parameters just on the left column of the main page. So that's searching. Um, do you guys have questions about that? If not, um, it's 11.23, so um, as is not unexpected, we uh, went a little bit longer than an hour, but it is probably time to wrap it up. Um, just as a final reminder, if you've got additional uh, staff members watching with you, please um, type their name into the question box and submit it to me so that I can um, add them to the attendance list for CE credit. Um, otherwise, if you are the person that signed in uh, to uh, go to webinar uh, to attend, I will have your particular name and email address uh, recovered. Um, otherwise, I think uh, we'll uh, finish for the day. And like I said, I've recorded this. So once I get the recording process done up, I will send out information about how to access it in case you have other staff members that want to watch it later. Thanks so much for attending.